So the title, this this uh, input is about the universal preferences of the Society of Jesus. And I'm John Dardis, a Jesuit from Ireland. So hello to all the Irish that are listening in or watching. Um, I'm a Jesuit for many years now. And um, it's been a, a varied life, lots of different things. So um, I think the big conversion moment for me was when I worked for a short time as a prison chaplain. And I really, I think I had to let go of so many uh, ideas about myself. I had a kind of a narrow view of myself. I had to let that go and have a new dream. It was a totally new space for me to try to go into. I had to let go of prejudices. And it was tough. But at the same time, um, it was a way to start dreaming a different dream for my own life and for my own work as a Jesuit. Um, I want to thank all the people from Karnataka who've helped to make this possible. Um, Prakash, sorry, um, Prashanth and uh, all the guys there, Avinash, Sunil, Josie. Um, I uh, hope you can understand my Irish accent, <laughs> and um, and we go from here. Just to uh, let me stop sharing the screen, and I'm just wondering if you can actually see me. Um, maybe I'll get some feedback on that. Um, just I want to check if I can interact with you back and forth. Um, someone just send me a PowerPoint if they wouldn't mind. We can see you. Great. Excellent. <laughs> um, Karnataka province, uh, fantastic province, full of energy, your mission in Kohima, your institutions, and not forgetting Charles Lastrado here, who's made such a fantastic contribution to the Curia and to the community here, not just to the work. So you've got amazing people. Also, Balaraju, who, when I was Irish provincial, he was he was uh, studying theology. So if you're listening, hello to you. Um, so I'm going to show some slides. You've begun to see some of them already. Um, let me just start the PowerPoint once again. That's a picture of a, a bridge in Ireland, in Northern Ireland. And I think we're at this bridge moment in our world today, a moment of change from one era to the next. Um, and when you're on a bridge, especially like the one in the picture, you can feel vulnerable. And I know that's how many people feel today in our world. Vulnerability of democracy, we saw it recently in the US. Vulnerability about COVID, so much vulnerability. Vulnerability about faith and interreligious dialogue. Can our faith traditions, can they dialogue with each other? So seeing then the great parts of Karnataka, I was checking this morning on the websites, different parts of Karnataka, so I hope to get there sometime. It looks amazing. Unfortunately, I'm only getting there virtually. Moving on, the, the preferences sometimes say, well, this word preference, what's, what's that about? But it's, it's us Jesuits with our mission partners. I know there are quite a few um, lay people and mission partners from different religious traditions listening in. So it's really our dream for our mission for the next 10 years. What are we trying to do? We have schools, we have universities, we have retreat centers and parishes and social centers. What are we trying to do? What are we trying to change? So let me let me explore that in the next half an hour. We're in this mission of hope and reconciliation across the world. That's one thing we're trying to do. You see so much division. I know even in Indian society, so many tensions at the moment my own country, Ireland. I worked for a while um, after the genocide in Rwanda in Africa. 
and so much need for reconciliation. And when I was in charge of JRS, Jesuit Refugee Service in Europe, um, visiting Sarajevo in Bosnia, which had been such a, a, a cosmopolitan and open city, and suddenly it was becoming very narrow, intolerant of any religious tradition except Islam, except the Muslim tradition. So we need this mission of hope. And I love this picture of Pope Francis. <laughs> Don't you like it? He's all, he's all fired up. <laughs> the preferences are missions to the Jesuits and to lay people listening here. They're missions from this Pope who's just so energetic. And you can even see he's almost angry there in that picture. He's certainly upset about something. <laughs> And I love that picture because I would like to have that game, same kind of passion and ability to get worked up um, and determined. And I give the preferences, if these apostolic preferences um, bring bring us there, we'll be we'll be fine. Our context is this, this bridge moment, as I said. Um, we're at this bridge moment. I love the picture of those Indian kids holding hands, reaching out to each other. So our world and indeed India, um, there is a turning point coming. North and south and east and west, sustainable, non-sustainable, rich and poor. And really there are so many, um, I suppose you'd say polarities or bridges to cross. And the question then to each of us is, well, what difference do, do I want to make? Um, again, just a quick check. Somebody sent me a message if there's any problems. I think it's full screen now. Um, and I hope you're hearing me okay. But just um, one of the organizers, feel free to send me a WhatsApp and uh, we'll, we'll check that. So what difference do I want to make in the next 10, 15 years? If you're in your 20s or 30s, maybe you're a young Jesuit, what's, what, what passion, what can give you a passion like that Pope Francis picture? Or if you're a woman working in one of our schools, what makes you excited about being in that mission? Or if you're a, an older Jesuit, maybe uh, nearing retirement, what's, what difference do you want to make in the next 5, 10, 15 years? Um, so this is really why we're having this discussion. Um, just it's, it's a great question. Often we can go from one thing to the next in our lives, so this hour together is a chance to, well, let's, let's look at the whole picture. Let's, let's dream a little bit about our world and also about our place in this world. I was talking to a friend of mine who's, uh, um, he doesn't have much religion, but he, he's on the, the board of trustees or the board of management of a, a school in, in, in Asia. In, and I said to him, well, what's, what's the school about? And he said, he paused for a moment and he said, John, it's, it's, um, it's about vocation. And I was thinking, wow, that's a, that's a very Jesuit word, a kind of a religious word. word. And I, I, I said it to him. I said, what is that? Tell me more. He said, well, we want every young person to leave our school feeling that they matter, that they're in this world for a purpose. Because he said, you know, many young people, they're so overwhelmed by complexity, by technology, that they, they, they can easily feel lost. 
So he said, our mission as a school is vocation, that they, no one would leave our school without feeling a sense of vocation. It's a terrific. So it's an example of this, this, part, this friend of mine, he had said, this is the difference that my institution wants to make. So what difference does your institution want to make? And if you're a young Jesuit, what difference do you want to make in the Society of Jesus? Connect back to why you joined. Or if you're just ordained, what difference as a young priest? Or if you're a brother, what difference do you want to make? It's the world, as I said, in need of hope. Um, there's those hands reaching out. It's a, a boat, I think, of migrants. You can see on the right, there's some water being being passed down to those kids. Um, yeah, and they're just, look at their faces. The little boy on the right, just beside the bottles of water. That little innocent face. So those hands are reaching out to you and to me. That's our world today. And look at these faces here. I love the little kid on the left. Look at his smile. Even he's obviously working at some sort of thing with stones. But he's somehow smiling. But it raises the question, should little kids like that have to work? And this one from Aleppo in Syria, you can see in the middle of um, in the middle of devastation and bombing, this tenderness, these these men, young men carrying these little babies. It has, the picture has everything. It has the destruction, it has the tenderness, and the little boy on the left, he's he's looking at you. And at me. So what difference are we going to make? A famous Jesuit said, our house is the world. The world is our house. Nuestra casa es el mundo. He was Spanish. Um, the sense that the Jesuit mission is universal. We're all over the world in all sorts of places from New York to Nigeria to Siberia to South Africa, India, Ireland, everywhere. You'll find Jesuit schools. I think it's two million students, two million students. So the world is our house, but the world is also in a in a critical state. This house is is not in great shape. There's the challenge of secularism. People that would say religion, faith is outmoded. You should be modern. Not so much a problem in India, I think, but certainly in Europe. Kind of an ideology about religion. You can see that's an advertisement on a, on a bus, actually. There's probably no God. Stop worrying. So this aggressive secularism that really, when we think about our students, even, even there in, in Karnataka, maybe it's even affecting your cultures, especially in cities. Consumerism, the advertising industry, extreme nationalism um, in many, many countries. Um, a lot of anxiety about President Modi or President Trump formerly. Many parts of Europe. So all these isms, ideologies that can separate people. But before we get too pessimistic, uh, it's also a world full of joy. Um, family life. I bet you can all think of even one thing today or yesterday where 
there was some moment of laughter or joy. This is uh, a friend of mine with his two daughters. And they're eating ice cream in Rome about a year ago, before the lockdown, before the virus. <laughs> so you can see the girl is ignoring me. and <laughs> She's very uh, keen to eat her ice cream. So it's a world full of these little acts of joy and tenderness and, and new life and beauty. That's a, a lake near Rome. It's a world with many, many positive things. And there's a, an interreligious meeting in Assisi. I talked about um, differences between religions, but Pope Francis has done a lot to bring religions together. So there's, there's hope also. And I talked about COVID, but there's a picture of from your country, from South Asia, from India, of a, a, um, an, an initiative to get the vaccine out to people. So there's, there's a lot of good things and hopeful things happen. Moving on, leadership. Leaders come in all shapes and sizes um, in our world. And, and in our Jesuit institutions, we help people to become leaders so they can make a difference. And if you're a teacher or a spiritual advisor or a young Jesuit, you're called to give some sort of leadership moral leadership, leadership in your family if you're married, um, some sense of, of solidity, dependability. So I did this exercise once, and if this was a workshop down there with you, I'd liberation from um, oppression by um, legislation, getting your rights taken away. So this, this journey to liberation, it's, it's a pilgrimage. It's a pilgrimage, an inner pilgrimage. We know about these outer pilgrimages we make, like there's a, a pilgrimage site that you all recognize. But this inner pilgrimage, my own inner journey, where are you on your inner journey today? How's your heart today? It's a great question again. And we're looking for possibilities in our world, not to go along with the same, the same, the same. Look for possibilities for change and to see with new eyes. Those of you who are Jesuits will know about the special Ignatian year, which starts in May this year and goes on until July of 2022. And the theme is to see with new eyes. Can I see myself with new eyes, the eyes of compassion? Often we're so hard with ourselves. Can I see the poor with new eyes? Can I see Young people, can I see the world through the eyes of young people? And can I see our mother, the earth, with new eyes? So this looking for possibility is liberation, possibility. There's a, a, a group of, of things here. And then reimagining ourselves, myself. Moving on to the preferences, if you look at the bottom of that slide, we see that we have, we have four. How do we get to this liberation? Well, there are four mission orientations. If the overall mission is liberation, well, here's four paths to that liberation. Four directions, four roads we can take four compass points of orientation 
always towards liberation. And in the Christian tradition, it's liberation comes through Jesus. Um, four ways to arrive at freedom and to help others be free. So these universal preferences are our, our dream, really, for the, next, for the next 10 years. And what are they? Well, the first is to, to find God and to show the way to God. I love this picture, these two pictures, because the first one, the young man is on his own, looking out, searching, wondering. And on the right, you've got this Pope Francis with various religious leaders. Because we, we help each other find the way to God. Yes, there are moments on our own, like the, the young guy on the left. We need those moments. And then we, we, we join hands and we walk with each other on the road to God. These different religious traditions, you can see them there in that picture. And they are different. You can see um, the different clothes even that are, that maybe to some people seem strange. Um, the difference is, imagine if we were all the same, it'd be so boring. <laughs> so to find and show the way to God, and then the Jesuit way is, as I said earlier, through the, the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, founder of the Jesuits. So that's the first compass point, and in some ways it's the basic compass point. And I think all of us as human beings, we are, there's something in us that looks for something deeper. When I worked in those camps with refugees from Rwanda, I was there one day on my own. There was great tension in the camps. Um, huge tension. Let me stop the sharing for the moment and I'll tell this little story. And the a, a lot of horrible things happening in the camps, murder, rape, really the survival of the fittest. And this day, four young guys came up to me. I'd say they were in their 20s. They were coming towards me. And I have to say, I was, I was scared. Um, vulnerable. I didn't have any weapons with me. And there had been some, some killings. But they said to me, are you, are you a priest? I said, yes, I'm, I'm a Jesuit priest. And they said, well, we, we were studying to be priests before we had to leave our country. And we, now we're here and we feel, we feel helpless. And can you, can you teach us the Bible? Can you introduce us to Jesus Christ? So I said, sure, yes, of course. And every week after that, we would sit in a small hut with, with no walls. And we would, we would read the, 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 the Christian and the Jewish scriptures and talk about, talk about God, talk about this search for God. And I know it had a big impact on me because whenever afterwards, when I was back in Europe and I met people who were apathetic about faith or not interested um, or critical, 
I would be so encouraged that I had met those four young men that in the darkest place on earth, they had, they were listening to something deep inside themselves. So I would say to you, whatever your religious tradition, Hindu or Muslim or Christian or skeptical, there's something deep inside every human being that, that, that is longing for, for more. And so this, this first apostolic preference of the society to, to find God, to show the way to God is, is, um, is for me, it's, it's so inspiring personally. So this is for me a really important aspect and it's, it's why I became a Jesuit and a Jesuit priest. Um, I had a very strong experience when I was 17 in a religious um, ceremony of something very deep. And I knew that that was something I had to follow in my life. So finding and showing the way to God. The second compass point is walking with the excluded, the marginalized, those whom our cultures cast aside. You can see on the left, there's a picture of some refugees arriving in Europe, being carried in. In fact, being welcomed by that young man on the left. You can see the fear in the eyes of the girl. And on the right, there's this lovely picture of these happy children. But they're obviously poor. Um, they're obviously poor. So our second compass point, and I would suggest a compass point for all of our lives even, is finding some way to walk with the poor, the excluded, the, I guess, the Dalits maybe in your societies, those who are in, in the caste system considered less important. There's a real call there to walk with them, walk with those people. And it's not easy sometimes. Um, in Jesuit tradition, we talked 30 or 40 years ago more about working for the poor. And then we realized we, we need to learn from the poor and listen and respect. Our father general here, um, the word apparently, in, he's, a, he's from Venezuela, so he speaks Spanish as his mother tongue. Um, people cast aside, the Spanish is descartados. And even though I don't really speak Spanish, it, it just, it says so much, the descartados. Thrown aside, you're not important, you don't matter. Stop bothering us. So that the excluded, our schools, our institutions, our retreat centers are called to put this into practice. And you locally, and we here in Rome, we have to work out how that, how that can happen. And again, young Jesuits listening, what does that mean for you? I know the provincial is listening there. What does it mean for this province of Karnataka? Already you do so much up in Kohima and in other areas. The third is accompany young people in a creation of a hope-filled future. Again, I love the last phrase, hope-filled future. I told you the story of my friend who's in, uh, involved in this school. Everybody leaves the school with a sense of vocation, of hope that they matter. And the last compass point, the last orientation is the care of the common home, our planet, which is suffering so much. I was out walking in, in here in Italy recently around Rome and just a number of plastic bottles thrown around just scandalous. And unless we work together to change that, 
you know, one person picking up a plastic bottle doesn't do very much. But 10 million people picking up plastic bottles or not using plastic does an immense amount. So just to recap, the care of the common home, young people, the excluded, and finding and showing the way to God. Where can you start? I think the starting point is gratitude for what you're already doing. If we start by piling a lot of extra work on ourselves and feeling guilty, our motivation just goes straight downhill. Starting with gratitude. Um, where, am I, where am I helping with the excluded now? How am I helping young people find hope? Maybe if you've got a family, maybe it's your young kids. Encouraging. Enabling them. Dreaming with them. So gratitude is, is a great starting place, a very Jesuit and Ignatian starting place. So I'm almost finished, but just as the presentation comes near to an end, I want you to think a bit um, over what I've said. You've been listening attentively, as far as I can see, as far as I can make out. What phrase or image strikes you in all that I've said? It might be one of those pictures, might be a word. So just maybe if you've got a pen and paper handy, write it down or write it on the back of your hand or just let it sink in. What phrase or image strikes you? What's attractive? What consoles you? What gives you hope? How's your heart as we're ending this presentation? Are you feeling more hopeful? Are you feeling bored? Is there a little bit of a dream, a spark emerging? Anything that makes you a bit anxious or fearful? Make a, make a short note for yourself, as I said, if you've got a pen handy or a piece of paper. Um, just something that you're going to take away from this presentation. What's your takeaway from all this, all these words that have been flying past you in this strange Irish accent? What phrase or image strikes you? What attracts you, consoles you? makes you a bit fearful or have you got questions? Just take a minute or two. Again, if I was there with you, I might play some music to give you more time, but Just take a minute. Or if I was together, we'd, we could, we'd have a small sharing about it now in small groups or with your neighbor. But these are all ways that you can open your heart and your mind by just noticing the last 30 or 40 minutes. And just to conclude, we have those four compass points and we have to set out on this journey. Sorry, the bottom of the slide is a bit, um, a bit cut off, but the world is waiting. So there are these four compass points for young Jesuits, for older Jesuits, 
for it. Those of us involved, all of us, all of us are involved in this Jesuit mission, and they're giving us this this orientation. And we we can't wait. Um, if not now, when? And there's this great quote from from Gandhi: "The future depends on what we do in the present." Wonderful, a wonderful um, and very wise thought. So what we do now about climate, about accompanying young people, about the excluded and the poor, and about God in our world and in our lives, again, from whatever faith tradition we come from, the future depends on what we do now. And secondly, from Gandhi, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. To be the change. And a little, stop, stopping with a little, <laughs> a little humor, any adventure has its risks. So if you're feeling a bit anxious, it's pretty normal. And mistakes, probably you'll make plenty of them. I certainly have. And as the little orange there says, sometimes you just have to pick yourself up and and carry on. <laughs> so I'll stop for questions. Um, I'll exit the sharing. No questions from the floor. I, I will read out some questions from the YouTube uh, channel. Uh, is that okay? There is one question here, Father John. Uh, the question is, are we watering down our preferential option for the poor with our recent concern for ecology? That's a concern, but I think it's not true. I think that the concern for ecology, when you look at the disaster sites in the Amazon, in the Congo Basin, and in Europe, in fact, all over the world, you see that who are the people most affected by problems of the common home? It's usually the poor who suffer first and who suffer most. Rich people can protect themselves, can build walls, can have all sorts of defenses, but the poor are the ones who have to suffer the consequences of global warming or of extreme rains or of lack of rain. Look at Sub-Sahara Africa. These climate change issues are affecting the poor. So I think we're actually a bit late in realizing this and in coming to the aid of the poor by looking at this issue of the common home, which is underneath so many problems. Thank you very much. There is one more question here. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for that uh, answer, Father John. There's one more question here, uh, namely, uh, someone is asking, um, have we, uh, in your opinion, Father John, have we Jesuits have taken sufficient risks in reaching out during this COVID pandemic times? What's your opinion about it? Well, I was part of the group that founded Jesuits.online, which listed the different initiatives that Jesuits were taking. And when we started it, we thought, we'll, we'll put up a few things. But the initiatives, the list of things kept flooding in. And I remember one day saying, we have to put some sort of order on this website because nobody can find anything now. In fact, we had this problem in the Curia that <laughs> there was so much happening at local level, so many initiatives that we were finding it hard to put some sort of list or structure on them. I think at the beginning, there was some disquiet that we were not visiting hospitals, um, risking our lives. But I think even if you go back to the great Jesuit saints who worked in the plague situations, they also had to, they took precautions about their own health and well-being. And if you're a hospital chaplain and you're visiting and there were Jesuit hospital chaplains, you needed to take precautions that you wouldn't spread the disease within the hospital. Um, 
I think in the end we got the balance more or less right. Um, I would have liked to see maybe, well, every, all of us would like to be be at the forefront of mission. In my own life, I've always tried to be at some sort of frontier, a frontier with young people, or a frontier with communications, or a frontier with refugees. Um, all of us, it's, it's part of the Jesuit DNA to be in these frontiers. And I think it's part of our human uh, DNA to, when you see suffering, I want to reach out. But Ignatius had this term of, of he called discerned charity, avoiding going off in 25,000 directions and really discerning, yes, I'll go there because I can make a difference and I can, I can be the hands of Jesus in that situation. Um, the COVID has been terribly difficult for all of us, terribly difficult. We've all felt confined. Um, uh, there is uh, there is one more there is one more question here. I says, uh, uh, is there any way of sharing our UAPs with the other congregations of our Catholic Church to have the greater effect in our adventure of implementing the UAP? Yes, <laughs> um, we've done various websites, and this this is so important. I'm frequently asked here in Rome to work with superiors, generals, other religious orders. They're excited about this. They want to work with us. Um, they want to walk with us on these preferences, on this road. Religious life today is more important than ever before. The world needs the prophetic voice that brothers and religious sisters and priests and even scholastics and novices can give. Because the message of the world, of the powerful, is blessed are the rich, blessed are the powerful, blessed are the ones who throw their weight around, blessed are those who wear designer clothes. And the message of the gospel is blessed are the poor, Blessed are the excluded. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice and human rights. And I think religious today, Jesuits, Dominicans, religious sisters, religious brothers, there is a profound sense of being together. And they do look, many do look to the Society of Jesus here. And we are trying to work with them and collaborate with them. We've created websites, and if anybody there wants to contact me, I can send you the links where these resources are freely available for other religious orders that basically say, here's, here's some steps you can take. Um, I've learned a lot myself through this. I came here, I was put in charge of discernment and, and apostolic planning, and I was at sea, I would say, for two years. But the one thing I learned was this message about gratitude. Looking around and seeing what religious do, Jesuits, religious sisters, religious brothers, scholastics, novices, the, the way our hearts are moved, and the, we're not perfect, but we're trying our best. And we are making a big difference. And to start with gratitude. And that liberates all sorts of new dreams. Um, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity, these preferences, uh, at a critical time for the world and for the planet. Okay, the next question is quite personal to you, Father John. Someone is asking which among the four uh, preferences, which would be your favorite preference? <laughs> That's a difficult question. Well, let me say, I'll tell you my vocation story very briefly. Um, I was, when I was a small boy, I wanted to be a priest. Um, I was an Irish, I was born in an Irish Catholic family. 
But as I went through high school, I I said, no, this is, I, I want to be a medical doctor and um, I want to have a family. And I had applied to medical school and uh, I was in my last year in high school. And one of the priests said to me, John, what, what will you do when you, when you leave school? And uh, I said, oh, I'm going to be a medical doctor. I had everything lined up. My, my life was planned. And he said, oh, I, I thought once you said to me something about being a priest. And I said, oh, yeah, but I, I gave that up. And he said, think again. Two words, think again. <laughs> And I was, oh my goodness, this whole question getting opened again. But I went on a vocation weekend and in the Eucharist, in the, in the Mass, on the Saturday evening, I had this very, very, very strong experience of Jesus, of God talking to me, um, of reaching down through all the layers of defenses in me to touch something very, very, very deep. And so the... The preference that really touches me in this one of is this one of finding God and showing the way to God. And when I've worked in prisons or worked in university chaplaincy or or even in administration. Um, and now here I, I still do some, even though I'm involved in a lot of administration in Rome, I still accompany some people. I give them spiritual guidance. Um, so... Yeah, being honest about it, it's the showing and find, finding God and showing the way to God to others or, or helping them to find God. Um, yeah, that's the, that's, the, that's the answer I would give. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Father John. There, is, uh, there are two more questions here. Perhaps there would be the last two questions. The first among them is uh, uh, someone is, it uh, looks like a person of Majis. He says... Uh, we have been talking a lot on UAPs, but the action seems to be minimum. What's your opinion about it? Well, I'll tell him to come to the Curia and look at the province plans that are coming in, because I'm in charge of seeing these plans that come in and giving a view of them to Father General. And there is a lot beginning to happen. I'll grant him that the start was slow, People were trying to, first of all, hear about them and learn about them. But now you're seeing action. And in fact, this year, we're starting a special video project for social media. One minute videos, um, walking with the poor, one gospel step at a time, journeying with young people, one gospel step. We'll have one video every week. And we're asking different parts of the world to send us footage, photographs, short film clips to reach, we're going to reach, we're going to try and reach thousands of people with this message. Walking with the poor, finding God, journeying with young people, caring for our common home. Things are beginning to move. Watch this space. Thank you very much. One last question here is, um, UN is a uh, United Nations is a very important body internationally. Can we have a collaboration with the UN uh, with regard to our apostolic preferences? That's a really good suggestion, actually. And um, the UN, the Global Development Goals. In fact, the way the way we express our preferences, the previous ones were just nouns: China, Africa intellectual apostolate. Because now we're saying, we're using verbs, walking with the poor, journeying with young people, finding God. And I think we are really, we, we need to be more open to working with bodies such as the UN. Terrific idea. There are possibilities. Um, there are blocks also. But I think we need to work more than ever with, with these kinds of bodies. Collaboration, working together. I suppose I emphasize this very much, really, and so does Father General. Other religious involved together. I remember I was uh, in Geneva. I gave a, a short speech to 
the United Nations uh, refugee body. It was an anniversary of the refugee body, and I was invited to speak on behalf of the NGOs. And it was just so moving to say, yeah, I'm a Jesuit, I'm working with refugees, and to see the kind of respect they had for the Society of Jesus. We can have a big impact um, because people know that our research is good, that we're not ideological, that we're on the ground with the poor, and that what we say is rooted in reality. So yes, yes, yes. So my question is, uh, there are for about 16,000 plus Jesuits in the world. And we don't belong to the province, we belong to the Society of Jesus. Now, for an example, say when Father Stan Sam is arrested, whether all these 16,000 Jesuits, we join together, we network and collaborate, and we, we put a concerted effort to condemn this type of human right violation. I'm not speaking only about Karnataka province here, or in mm -hmm. South Asia, but anywhere in the world. Do we have this type of uh, you know, sensitivity or a consciousness that we don't belong to a you know, province, but we belong to Society of Jesus? Therefore, all of us together, at least on social media, if not coming physically together, that we join together to condemn such type of uh, you know, act, evil act anywhere in the world. And if it is not so, what do you think? What are we supposed to do? I think it is, it's a great question. Thanks very much. Um, and I think, the co funnily enough, the COVID pandemic has made us much more universally active. As you said, we always have the rhetoric that we join the society, but the Stan Swami campaign has shown that the, the province there, the region there, the assistancy can leverage Jesuits across the world to make an impact. The BBC carried it, the New York Times carried it. Uh, today, uh, the Italian newspaper Avenire carried, carried Father General's message on it. Um, we're, I'd say we're, we're not as up to the mark as we should be. And the COVID has taught us a fantastic lesson that we can have a huge impact, a huge impact when we work together more and that we're not doing it enough, but we're getting there. So very hopeful and full marks to Xavier Jayaraj from, uh, I think it's Calcutta province, works here in the Curia, has really masterminded this Dan Swami campaign at global level. Um, so, and full marks to all the Indian Jesuits who were involved, CG there in the, in the uh, conference office. He's done an amazing job. You're lucky to have him. He's just a great guy. Thank you, Father Jossi, for moderating the question and answer session. Thank you, Father John Dardis, for patiently answering all our questions. Our hearts become joyful when they vibrate for and with others. This saying very well suits the present Jesuit provincial of Karnataka, Father Dionysius Vaz. Father Provincial, we are privileged to have you in our midst. Our hearts are filled with gratitude for the privilege of listening to this wonderful session on the universal apostolic preferences, a call to collaborate in God's mission. I request Father Dionysius Vaz, the Provincial, to express our gratitude in words. Dear Father John Dardis and Jesuits and collaborators of uh, South Asia. First of all, I want to thank you, Father John, for uh, really capturing our imaginations and awakening our desires about the UAPs. If only you have encountered Father John Dardis, and I had the opportunity in the congregation of 36, you soon are touched by his simplicity of life and open-mindedness that make him a man with a vision and fired with a mission. And we encountered that during this session. Ever since you took charge as General Counselor of Discernment and Apostolic Planning, there has been a new wave in the society with discernment in common, spiritual conversation, apostolic planning and collaboration and networking, gaining much importance in the society. I still remember our face-to-face -face encounter with you 
my face-to-face -face encounter with you during the murmuratio, and once or twice during our spiritual conversations. You came across to me as a simple and humble Jesuit, passionate about expressing your convictions, articulate and communicating your views, having great skills in listening, planning, and organizing, and most of all, a person of interiority, depth, and reflection. It came across very strongly during this session, and thank you very much, John, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. I want to thank Father Prashant for his painstaking effort. I think Prashant has been the director of uh, Prerana, taking a lot of efforts to go online and organizing this webinar and organizing it so well. I thank, thank you, Prashant. Mm. Give him a big round of applause. <laughs> thank you, Father Brian, director of uh, Jesuit Navas, and uh, Father Daniel Fernandez, the principal of St. Joseph's Commerce College, for availing the space for us, for organizing this place, and uh, of course, uh, creating this uh, ambience for us to interact with John Dabis. Thank you very much. <laughs> for all of those present here who have come from different communities in Bangalore, from Bangalore, taking the trouble, taking the time, having the great interest in the UAPs and wanting to implement it in your communities. Thank you for coming here. So also all of you online, those who are online with us, I'm sure our collaborators and Jesuits who are there, I want you to thank you for bringing this UAP alive. Let this UAP be a horizon for us, a point of reference for the whole of the Society of Jesus that will inspire our discernment in common and apostolic planning at all levels of its life and mission. May it unite us in our mission, not only as provinces, but as a whole society. May it be a guiding force to restructure the society's governance and for creating working networks, both among ourselves and with others, our lay partners, especially in the Ministry of Justice and Reconciliation, the mission that the congregation GC36 has given to us, the mission of the society today. Thank you very much, and God bless us all. Thank you for the provincial for those words of gratitude. Desmond Tutu says, we are made for goodness. We are made for love. We are made for friendliness. We are made for togetherness. We are made for all of the beautiful things that you and I know. We are made to tell the world that there are no outsiders. We are all one and we belong to one God's family. Pope Francis says, the process that the Society of Jesus followed to come up with these universal apostolic preferences was truly one of discernment. Therefore, the call to collaborate in God's mission to find and show the way to God, walking with the excluded, journeying with the youth, caring for our common home, is a universal call to all of us to be persons of faith, hope, and love. Thank you all for being a wonderful audience. I'm sure all of us will take back valuable insights on the universal apostolic preferences from this webinar. With this, we draw the curtains on this webinar till we meet again. Thank you. God's blessings on all of us. Have a pleasant evening.